What the hell is the reds are? Why is it so vague and unclear? And if you score above a 65, does that mean you're autistic? Hi, my name is Alice Kelly. I'm an autistic person who cares a lot about other autistic people and the earth saving networks that we can create together. I'm breaking down the RADS R, what it does, who it's for, and what it fails to accomplish for the autistic community. We welcome autistic adults, neuro lurkers, and anyone who wonders what an autism assessment could look like. When you make commentary below, we ask that you acknowledge what group you identify with. The RADS R, what is it? Who made it? And what is it for? The RADS R is one of many diagnostic tools that can help guide somebody through the experience of self-diagnosis. It's also commonly used in a clinical or official setting, like a psychiatric assessment. RADS R is a questionnaire. <laughs> I'm looking over at my notes. <laughs> The RADS R is a questionnaire that seeks to assess a range of behaviors and experiences that are relevant to autism as is explained in the DSM-5 under Autism Spectrum Disorder. The creator of the RADS R is Dr. Rita Ritvo. The original was made in 2008. She provided an updated study in 2011. A tiny bit of context on her. Ritvo graduated from a California Graduate Institute in 2006 with a PhD. Dr. Ritvo had a clinical practice that centered around children that closed one year before the RADS R was released originally. She's published multiple articles about autism as understood through the DSM-5, and her studies include introducing, clarifying, and adjusting the RADS R to suit several international contexts, including a Japanese and a Swedish version. There are some articles that Ritvo has released that use harsh, outdated language, so that's a forewarning before you Google Scholar her, and I'll hold my thoughts on that for today. Dr. Ritvo currently serves as an assistant clinical professor at Yale University. She teaches Psychology 350, Autism, and other related disorders. Autism and related disorders. So back to the test. It's suitable for adults. Some people say over the age of 16. Other sources say over the age of 18 who have a late diagnosis of autism. It says that it's for men and women. Very binary language, but a late diagnosis is people who didn't receive a autism docs in primary school or through other routes of what they call early intervention. And then the RADS R is available in only English right now, and I'm gonna put the link below in the bio. You can take that. Like I said before, the RADS is available for self-assessment or to take in a clinical setting. Very interestingly, diagnostic professionals being present can affect the sensitivity of the report by up to 30% for the worse. It depends on their familiarity with the range of autistic experiences across assigned or experienced genders. On the other hand, a well-informed clinician could help with some of the stickier language, particularly doctors who understand autism outside a deficit focus perspective. Doctors who understand in a balanced framework the strengths and weaknesses that come with being autistic. Better doctors are able to illuminate the context and intended meaning of the questions, particularly the normative questions. So the RADS are identifies diagnostic criteria along with the DSM-5 for individuals who they would call subclinical or people who basically passed and were able to mask up until adulthood. There are three sections of the DSM-5 where they describe a normative perspective of autism. People who want a clinical diagnosis would struggle with these according to psychiatric assessment. I'm not a doctor. I'm just gonna read these off. Language, ability and desire for holding reciprocal conversations, having a normal social demeanor, initiating or responding to interactions with others, using language for sharing interests and emotions with others, and meaningful differentiation in tone and affect. <clears throat> Two, social relatedness. 
ability and experience of connecting with others and maintaining those connections in various social environments, level of interest in familiar people, and the ability and desire to share imaginative play with others. And then finally, sensory and motor issues. Regarding nonverbal communication, such as ability and desire to make eye contact, I've made some slight adjustments here. It doesn't say desire in the DSM. Nonverbal communication, such as ability and desire to make eye contact, maintain predictable and normatively consistent body movements, utilize gestures and facial expressions effectively. There is another subset that was added in the 2011 version of the Rad's R that asks questions about what people would call special interests. I just call them passions. The Rad's R is 80 questions and it takes between 10 and 30 minutes. The Rad's is on a three point scale. There's four different options for each question. I'm gonna pop it up right here. True now and when I was young, true only now, true only when I was younger than 16, and never true. And those have a value of zero through three, and you collect more points <laughs> to uh, reach an autism diagnosis. And I'm not gonna talk about what each individual question is worth, or like what each answer is worth for each individual question, because I'm not interested in skewing results for people. I just wanna bring in some information about this test. The highest possible score, which nobody has ever reached in a clinical setting, is 240, but you only need 65 points to indicate the presence of autism. Now in Ritfo's research in 2011, not a single autistic scored above 65. If you score above 65 on the RADS and you're an autistic, you're a medical anomaly, baby. On a similar note, back in 2011, only 3% of autistic people scored below a 65. I know personally autistic people who have scored below a 65. That does happen, and we're going to talk about why in a little bit. Stay around for that. So here are some of the criticisms of the RADS. The four values that are available to answer each question are not specific enough. Situations are complex and nuanced, and this test cannot reflect that. So you have to settle for the best answer rather than what is true. And I know that can be difficult for a lot of us. Not being able to add in our qualifications can be cerebrally difficult. So that's one problem. For example, one question is, others consider me odd or different. And right now I would say coworkers at my last serving job would definitely describe me as like intense and jarring and off-putting. Something's kind of weird with her. <laughs> but the people that I now surround myself with and my friends in high school, all neurodivergent, they would not consider me odd and different. I was a choir kid, you know, at some point in my life, a theater nerd. Context. It's common for autistic people, particularly young adults and teenagers, to score much lower than they would if they fully understood what the questions themselves were asking. It's difficult to recognize one's own behavior through the normative framework that is part of many of these questions. A trusted doctor or a person who knows you well and understands social expectations can really help guide you in translating the meaning of the question and helping you find an appropriate response. One of the biggest issues I have with this is a lot of the questions just aren't representative of what it is like to live with autism. They're based on the white male, often young male perspective because that's what most of the research has been done on. Hans Asperger didn't even think that girls could be autistic, despite there being research prior to his identifying of autism by Grunia Sukarova. Back to the script. Quite a few of the questions are dehumanizing and demeaning and disrespectful to autistic people, particularly questions that are about compassion, intimacy, and empathy. This is where the normative questions come into play because they assume that an autistic person, based on the onlooker's perspective, lacks compassion, doesn't value close relationships, speaks in a monotone, can never enjoy small talk or conversations with people who don't share the same interests as them. I'm gonna read off some of these according to Ritvo's rubric. These are not things that I believe, but 
In her analysis, autistic people would say that these things are never true, and picking something other than never true will get you less autism points. There's seven. One, I am a sympathetic person. Two, I speak with normal rhythm. And I made a little note that says consistent, ordinary, unremarkable. Three, I am an understanding kind of person. Four, I try to be as helpful as I can when other people tell me about their personal problems. Five, I am considered to be compassionate. Six, I usually speak in a normal tone, consistent, ordinary, unremarkable. And seven, I like to have close friends. So according to Dr. Rickbo, if you're autistic, then you're gonna say, no, I don't like to have close friends. No, I'm not a sympathetic person. No, I'm not considered to be compassionate. In fact, in an alternative study that's much more recent, I will link all of my sources below, two thirds of autistic adults were informed by clinicians that they didn't meet the criteria of a diagnosis according to the RADS-R. Explanation for the RADS-R on embraceautism.com suggests that the normative questions that indicates what humans should be like is outdated. Engelbrecht actually reached out to Dr. Ritvo about the changing effectiveness of the test and Dr. Ritvo did not reply. Dr. Engelbrecht, who supplies a, a couple of more critiques that I have of the RADS. Even though I do think it's a place to start, all autism tests that I am aware of, as well as the RADS, lack a recognition of intersectionality and how different identities layer to create different experiences of autism. So let's consider again the others consider me odd or different. What people consider to be odd or different has a lot to do with racism and homophobia and misogyny. Having the courage to be yourself seems to be an autistic trait unless it's traumatized out of you. <laughs> and then queerness. One question is, I'm very sensitive to the way my clothes feel when I touch them. How they feel is more important than how they look, but I am a queer femme. And I understand that sometimes beauty is pain. And accomplishing a look like wearing platform heels at the gay bar all night is sometimes worth the discomfort. Whereas at home, there's no way I'm going to wear a pair of jeans or even have multiple layers on me because I don't like the way that layers snag when they rub. That can make me cry. But also I understand my own limitations and my energy levels at this point because I've learned how to work with my own understanding and experience of autism. I know when that's an energy tax I'm able to take. This test could include questions that ask about your understanding of social constructs and where they come from, like gender. Many autistic people exist outside of binary concepts of gender. So these normative questions lead autistic people to score lower than is clinically accurate, which leads to a misdiagnosis. And as probably unintentional but is gaslighting because somebody that's receiving an autism diagnosis is clearly struggling in multiple areas of their life or perhaps they just don't want to identify with it without like an official diagnosis. These normative questions dehumanize autistic people based on the nautistic's perception of our empathy and compassion. The RADS R has problems with false equivalency. Having a lack of compassion, interest in caring for people, empathy is not what is autism. To be autistic does not mean to lack compassion, to not want to care, to not have empathy for others. I know so many people with borderline who they would be described as over emotional, they would be completely left out of a diagnosis and that's probably why they often are because they express their feelings in different levels of extremes are definitely autistic. So the RADS R is one of many tests that you can take by yourself or with a doctor to determine if you are autistic. If you think that you're autistic, but based on this test alone, you don't qualify, I would take other tests. I recommend that you do too. We can talk about a couple of those briefly. Firstly, and I think least effectively is the autism spectrum quotient which is like an introductory diagnostic test should more inquiries be made the second one is the cat q which measures masking or camouflaging abilities and can apparently fill in the gaps that most tests miss. I don't think that I've taken the cat cue. The final one is the Aspie quiz, and I have huge issues with the term Asperger's and with the man Asperger himself 
However, that is the name of the quiz. Its goal is to identify autism and other co-occurring conditions. Again, for this one, it can be helpful to have a person that you trust there to describe you accurately and help clarify some of these questions. But overall, there are not enough tests that are created by autistic people for autistic people. Significantly, they're made mostly by white people. There are more women involved now, but there are a lot of people who are not white women that deserve tests that more accurately align with their experiences so that they can get clarity on their neurotype. How people experience an autistic life, an autistic way of being, and how they experience masking or camouflaging is going to be different based on your cultural background, your parents' parenting style, household expectations, religious expectations, etc, etc. There's a couple more points that I want to mention. Why would you want to get diagnosed with autism? People who are late diagnosed tend to have a higher IQ, another thing that I have problems with measuring IQ, but they tend to be overlooked and then have higher levels of emotional and behavioral struggles later in life versus people who are diagnosed young in primary school or around the age of two even and given the tools to navigate the world and hopefully a way that respects who you are as an autistic individual and doesn't isn't Pavlovian dog training. I hope that was fun for you and it was for me to compile a lot of research on it. There's more and more autistic people who are proud to be autistic in research right now, creating new resources for us and bringing us forward more information all the time. So I'm very hopeful for the future. Closing thoughts on this. Autistic people knowing our capacity for change making and community by our own design is a potent threat to fascism which relies on conformity and silence. The freaks will inherit the earth. The autistic suicide rate is really high and I don't think that that's because our life is inherently unbearable, though everybody's gonna have different experiences of being autistic. It's because they convince us that we are broken and alone and that we should hide the things that make us who we are. We don't need to do that anymore. We don't need to be isolated. They pathologize us to separate us by shame and take away our right to choose how we're going to live, our right to choose our future, not anymore. I'm Alice Kelly. Follow me on TikTok. Follow me here on YouTube, please. I'm gonna keep making more videos about autism and hopefully I'll be helping you. Thanks for listening.